I love the idea of a guy that's genuinely confused that Alan might be yelling at a flashlight that's just sitting on the table. (laughs) (laughs) Alexa, lubricate. (laughs) User error 77. I'm Joe. I'm Alan. And I'm Dan. And we're back and we've got some more hashtag ask error questions for you. And remember, you can ask us those on Twitter or in the Jupiter Broadcasting Telegram group. Just use the hashtag ask error. They can be about anything you want. So the first question, this is just such a weird thing that someone asked that I thought we had to include it. Is there anything you close your eyes while doing that other people might think is odd? Yeah. Uh, When doing percussive maintenance such as uh, hammering a nail into a wall i often i I often think i'm looking at the nail and then when i hammer it i don't remember actually seeing the hammer hit the nail i'm pretty sure i blink at the point when i hit the nail i think that's called flinching yeah but i do it every single time and i know i'm gonna hit the nail and i do it every single time i mean that's only one example. There are, there are others. Like, do you ever find yourself doing repetitive behavior when you're driving down the road? Like, I don't know, tapping the steering wheel in time with going over cat size in the road or. Are you going to tell me that you close your eyes while you're driving? <laughs> uh, I might blink in time with certain things. Yeah. Do you blink for a lengthy period of time or just very briefly? I, I would defer to the definition of blinking as opposed to the definition of sleeping. But right. yes, okay. it's not for a prolonged period generally. It's not like I'm going to close my eyes between the 300-yard marker and the 200-yard marker or anything like that. But I don't know. There's something about like repetitive behavior when doing certain things that I close my eyes for. and I, I don't know why that is. Right, so we've established that you are terrible at DIY and driving. <laughs> yeah, right. you are the unsafest operator of eyeballs ever. <laughs> We're doing something dangerous now. Should we turn them off? All right. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Dan, then? Uh, I, I don't know if it's weird, but, like, the thing that came to mind was, like, if I'm exercising and I'm trying to get in, like, another couple reps, sometimes I'll close my eyes because I don't know why. For some reason, that makes me feel like I can do it more. I don't think that's particularly odd. That's kind of shutting off that sense so you can like really concentrate on that rep or whatever. I think that's relatively normal. Mm, I don't know then. I can't, I think, I feel like I close my eyes at appropriate times. I feel I've peaked too early here and maybe I should have waited for you guys to answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had no answer for this until we started recording. And um, so a little glimpse behind the curtain, dear listener. When we record, we leave a bit of silence and then we can use audacity to uh, remove the hiss and just general noise, harm your desktop, probably that sort of thing, um, from the recording. And so we have to uh, like all hold our breath and do a bit of silence for a few seconds. And I always close my eyes during that, um, which I have come to realize is slightly odd. Yes, yes, it is. Why do you need to close your eyes? Is your is the air going to leak out through your eyes or something? <laughs> yeah. No, what it is, right, it, it links back to when I'm doing a really tricky edit. Um, and if I really need to concentrate on what I'm listening to, I close my eyes. And that by shutting off that one sense of vision, I'm somehow able to listen better. I don't know. It's obviously not true, but it just somehow tricks my brain. And so I think it's that. It's because when I I lean back in my chair, hold my breath and close my eyes, listening for any weird noises of pipes creaking and stuff, just so that I know I've got enough silence that I can do the noise removal. It sounds like that thing of like, uh, oh, I got to park, so I'm going to turn the radio down. Yeah, I always pause my podcasts when I'm coming up to like a complicated junction that I'm going to have to really concentrate on. This sounds exactly like me driving. This is just normal. Yeah, much like you're blinking, eh? What's your biggest or most significant tech blunder? What is a tech blunder? Uh, Good question. Well, I'll give you one, and then you can decide whether either of you have done something which qualifies as a worse tech blunder than this. Fair? Fair. So I used to work for a large company, and... That is a tech blunder. uh, Yes. (laughs) uh, We used to to have a lot of um, SAP systems and Oracle databases, and... 
there's a, a process that's part of Oracle that's very important. And if that process goes away, basically the database goes away. And I was SSH'd into the wrong machine at the point when I killed a process and I managed to take down the production Oracle database for this very large company. And as soon as I did that and I looked at my screen and I got that horror of, oh, holy shit, I've absolutely buggered the production system, which is quite a, um, a piece of work because it means someone somewhere is going to have um, a bad day trying to bring this thing back up and lots of people around the world aren't going to be able to do their job for a few hours or maybe a day. And so I had to fess up and I just turned around to my line manager. I was like, um, I've just killed the listener in production. And he went, what? And I was like, I was doing it in QA and I did it in production. I'm sorry. We need to fix this. And then loads of red lights started going off and people started coming around and chasing us. Um, because it was, yeah, a bad day. So that's, that's probably my worst tech blunder is killing the production system for a very large company. I think. Yeah, that counts. Man, I think you won. I think like the worst thing I've ever done is like downloaded too much porn and <laughs> fucked up a yes, <laughs> fucked up a laptop. So those were the Windows days. Well, I remember back in my Windows days, I deleted a partition that contained all of my data accidentally while I was trying to install Windows. And as soon as I did it, I was like, oh fuck. I did have it all backed up on DVDs, about 17 <laughs> DVDs, <laughs> and then just spent the, the next couple of days just copying data back over. And it was never quite in the right places and stuff, and I had you know conflicts and whatever. So that was really annoying. And I have managed to fuck up a couple of production servers, but I've always managed to roll back. So nothing like that spectacular. Although I was thinking if you extend this a little bit, Probably my biggest tech blunder was back when I used to play drums in a band quite seriously, we wanted to add some electronic sounds to it. And so I thought, well, what's a cheap way of doing that? I'll buy a couple of drum pads and kind of like put them near my other drums and, you know, hook them up and everything. And I spoke to a fellow who was selling some stuff on eBay and I managed to pay a hundred quid, I think, for a pretty basic setup. And he said to me that there was a driver available to make it zero latency. It's all fine. And so then I set it all up and you'd you sort of hit it and it'd be like hit, bang, hit, bang, like massive latency. And then the company that had the driver stopped selling it or something. And so I just ended up with a hundred quids worth of just shit that didn't work. And I managed to cart it around a couple of moves and then finally just throw it away and it just pained me that I just wasted a hundred quid. So that was something of a tech blunder. It's funny when you start talking about backups and stuff, I remember some of my other past tech blunders. <laughs> so yeah, that's <laughs> nice, but none that have affected lots of people. I've had one where I formatted someone's hard drive. I think I may have told this story before, so I won't, but I formatted someone's hard drive because I was told to, and she didn't realize that she didn't have a good backup of the stuff that was on her machine. So she lost some data, which was a book she was writing. Oh, um, no. <laughs> yeah. Well, it actually wasn't even her book. It was her boss. Here. She was, uh, her boss was writing a book and she was, um, typing it up for him. And she had the only electronic copy on that PC and I formatted it. So yeah. Go me. And at Christ Christmas parties every year, she would point at me across the dance floor and go, that's the guy who formatted my hard drive. <laughs> like, oh, my God. Well, it's not as bad as someone I know who forgot to back up a couple of Bitcoin when he formatted his. And at the time, it was worth, you know, 5 or $10. And it was only when it started to be worth, like, nearly 20000 that he was really face oh, about man. it. Oh, oh, man. Yeah, I don't think I've had any, like, super catastrophes like, you know, I've had a disc fail here and there, but I, and I don't think I've had anything that is like public, although me now describing a faux pas that I made uh, eight years ago is now public. So, yay. I feel like I've jinxed myself now. Like now I'm going to have some kind of massive failure of untold scale that's just going to happen out of nowhere. Oh, I played a joke, a joke on someone that went wrong once. Um, uh, when we recorded uh, the Ubuntu podcast at my house once, 
uh, one of the presenters, Dave Walker, was sat next to me with his laptop and he went out for a cigarette. And while he was out, I picked up his laptop and I was going to paste a fork bomb <laughs> onto his laptop, but not press enter. I was just going to leave the characters in the terminal on his laptop. And he had a terminal already open. And I couldn't remember the combination of characters for a fork bomb. So I went to Wikipedia and just did Wikipedia fork bomb because I was having to be in a hurry because he was only out for a few minutes having a cigarette. And I copied the fork bomb by just double clicking it in Wikipedia. And then I alt tab to the terminal and just hit paste. And unfortunately it copied both the fork bomb and carriage return. No. And so when I pasted <laughs> it, it pasted the fork bomb and hit enter and executed it, which just locked it up. And I just went, Oh, and put the laptop down. <laughs> I was like, Oh shit. And he came back in and went, what, what are you doing? And he looked at his laptop and actually I hadn't broken his laptop because that, that, terminal that he had open was an ssh session to his oh, server no. <laughs> so i actually <laughs> remotely fault bombed his server i've <laughs> that was such a dick move but I, di I didn't intend to do it but you know there's a lesson in there he should have locked his screen before he walked away time to paste terminal commands from the internet yeah that, that as well <laughs> <laughs> that damn wikipedia <laughs> What's your favourite thing about your least favourite season and your least favourite thing about your favourite season? So we need to establish what our favourite and least favourite seasons are first. And if it's anything other than summer is best, winter is horrible, then you are wrong. Oh dear. Yeah, fall's clearly the best season. Uh, wrong. Fall has all the best colours, it has all the best foods, it has all the best weather. Uh, yeah, maybe if you live somewhere that should be a desert. Um Poppy, what are your favourite and least favourite seasons first then? Uh, so my least favourite season, I think, is autumn or fall. <laughs> and my uh, favourite, I think, is winter. What? Yes. Yes, that's right. I have a different opinion from you, Joe. And not just for the purposes of a podcast. <laughs> All right. So um, favourite thing about your least favourite season then? Chestnuts and horse chestnuts is basically the best thing about autumn because you can make conkers and have fights with people uh, with conkers on the end of string and fight other people who have conkers. That's good. And you can also roast chestnuts and they start falling in fall. <laughs> and so roasting them is delicious. So eating them and playing with them good things you didn't want to go with like pumpkin pie or like all the seasonal beers or like pumpkin pie doesn't exist outside america <gasps> it's an america what? only thing no nobody else yep. has heard of that it's like is that true yes it is totally true that is horrible <laughs> i'm so sorry well you seem to have a glut of pumpkins that you put them all over your doorsteps at, at this time of year i've got pumpkins up inside right exactly you've got too many of them dude you should dedicate that land to something else and not grow so many pumpkins then you wouldn't have so many that you have to make a disgusting pie out of them pumpkins are actually really easy to grow it's a vine right and it's borderline a weed they just they go crazy yeah i've seen stranger things so <laughs> yeah what about you joe so my Favorite thing about winter, which is my least favorite season, is that I can leave drinks outside and they get really cold because I like cold drinks and don't like anything hot drink wise. So cold drinks whenever I want them. Yeah, but don't flies get in them and stuff? No, I mean like sealed bottles and cans. Oh, you mean just like a fridge without having to spend any money on refrigerant? Well, yeah, or, you know, you forget to put your cider in the fridge and you just sort of leave it outside or whatever that sort of thing this is a concept i cannot relate to i'm afraid uh if if there is cider on a table in my back garden in the snow i will think a tramp has come into my back garden <laughs> and is now living in my shed so no i can't relate to that i'm afraid joe fair enough i'm not sure a cider would last more than like three days here well, yeah, and bottles of water as well. I can just leave those outside and they get cold. And yeah, if it just normally I put stuff in the fridge, obviously, but it's just handy to have that extra space outside, just basically a free, gigantic fridge. Anything I put outside gets stolen. Well, yeah, where my flat is, there's kind of a place that's outside that's like relatively 
um, not many people can get there, if you know what I mean. It's relatively hidden, so that's handy for me. As for my least favorite thing about my favorite season, so I love summer, but I just hate getting really hot and sweaty and being on the tube and stuff. It's just horrendous. But uh, I don't know, it's a small price to pay. So I'd have to say that my least favorite thing about the clearly superior fall slash autumn is the people. There's tons of people out because the weather is great and there's all this great food and beers and, and everything. And so it's like a really active season and all my favorite things that I want to do, everybody else is doing them too. So I wish there were less people. But um, my favorite thing about my least favorite season, which is winter, because you can do nothing in winter except stay inside because it's just raining and cold, is I guess just um, like hot cocoa and, and watching movies and that sort of thing. It's very much like, a, uh, well, we can't go anywhere or do anything, so let's eat bad and stay inside. Yeah, I mean, that is my other favorite thing as well, coming back in to a nice warm flat and being able to get into a nice warm bed with a thick duvet on and stuff. With two duvet inserts. <laughs> no, I have two different duvets. I have a summer duvet and a winter duvet. We didn't actually get out the winter duvet last winter because it wasn't cold enough. Fun fact. So my favorite season is obviously winter, obviously. And uh, the least favorite thing during winter, I think I would have to say is having to scrape the windscreen of the car in the morning. Everything else is fantastic, but having to get out of the house and and scrape, 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 especially if it's really welded on. Like, I don't have a car that can, like, defrost all its windows easily. I've got quite an old car. Um, and what I often do is just fill a two-litre coke bottle with water and just pour it all over the windscreen and pour it all over the back window and and then start the engine and leave it running and kill a few trees and then get in the car and drive away so that's that's the, usually what i do as a protest to the uh, frost clinging to my windscreen if humans were code and you could patch a bug or feature or issue that exists in most humans what would it be and what would you fix? I think we should make this a little more interesting and make it like real life, where for every bug you fix, there are regressions. So you should choose one, and then the other two get to choose a regression that comes with it. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll start then. I would patch out lying of any description. What? Yep. I'd make it so that people couldn't lie. That's That way, a Jim Carrey film... And it is where you end up with there. Yeah. No, I was thinking of that stupid Jim Carrey film where they just take it too far. It's not that he doesn't lie. It's that he just says everything that is possibly on his mind. And that's not, you're not lying by not saying things, but just either tell the truth or shut the fuck up is what I'm saying. So that's the exact regression that I would pair with that is you have to narrate everything that you are doing and thinking. <laughs> <laughs> so... You've written a Jim Carrey film from the 90s, well done. You, it can't work because people would just ask you, you know, to answer a question that they're looking for the truth on. And by not answering, you're, you're clearly, you know, admitting guilt or knowing that you can't tell the truth. I'd rather not answer that, thanks. You're going to get very bored of saying that phrase over and over and over again. <laughs> I'm not sure about that. I quite like the capability of lying because that way means we can have fun and tell stories. That Because if there was no lying, you'd never embellish a story. And one of the best things about stories, telling them over and over again, is they get better over time with embellishment. And if you can't lie, then you can't embellish a story. And I think that would lose something from culture. What about comedians? Oh, I was on my way here. No, you weren't. Ah, uh, oh, my wife. No, she isn't. Like, you would just eradicate so much from human culture by removing lying. So I, I, I don't like that one, no. Do you feel like all forms of untruth are lying, though? Is that really what we define as lying? Or do we really mean, like, lying to be misrepresenting things with, like, a malicious intent? Or if it's not malicious, is it actually, are you really lying about it? Or is it just... So long as you know it's not the truth... If you, if you internally know that the thing you're saying is not factually accurate and you're still saying it anyway, then you're totally, it's a lie. It's just like saying Father Christmas exists is a lie. It's not 
malicious. I disagree. I think we've been over that. Yeah, I know you were going there. Yeah, we have been over that. <laughs> but it's arguably, okay, it's not malicious. Um, uh, and and ni- neither is the comedian on stage telling a story, you know, about his mother-in-law. That's not malicious, but it's it's humorous and it's entertaining and it's cultural and we'd lose that. Yeah, but we'd have no uh, lies on the side of buses, though, would we? That's quite, you're, you're patching one specific problem. That's a very niche use case. Most of the time when you're fixing bugs, you have to look at the greater impact, the greater good, and the needs of the many, not the needs of the uh, 17 million. I think if I had a major annoyance that I would like to patch, it would be to properly digest lactose. That's very specific to you. <laughs> I think the question was more like humanity generally. Lots of people are lactose intolerant. It's not just me. Actually, Karen's lactose intolerant stuff is a little more severe than mine. Is this the kind of patch that if it was applied to everyone, for you, it would mean you can now eat cheese? But for me, who is not lactose intolerant, it would mean I can no longer eat cheese. Oh, that would be a, a twisted regression to introduce with that one. Presumably, it would mean you couldn't eat something, and you just wouldn't know what the results of that would be until you applied the patch. Or, if you patch the thing that says you can eat cheese, I can only eat cheese. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Anyone who couldn't eat cheese now can eat cheese, and everyone else has to eat cheese. Your lactose tolerance is so <laughs> high that your body just produces extra lactase all over the place, and you have to supplement with, like, cheese injections. <laughs> it's no longer lactose intolerance, it's lactose requirement. <laughs> <laughs> mm, I like that. Uh, I would patch... Uh, the capability, the speed at which knowledge is uh, accepted into the human brain. So I, I would like us to just be able to flick through a book, you know, like Johnny Five uh, flicks through a book and learns all of human knowledge, or like any uh, character from science fiction watches TV, or Lilu in Fifth Element, or. Anything where someone flicks through Wikipedia or Encyclopedia Britannica or something and just absorbs all that knowledge and then pick up a book and then you just absorb everything. I would like to greatly accelerate the speed at which the human brain accepts knowledge, like the Matrix kind of thing. I knew, I know jujitsu, that kind of thing. And the downside is now you know, like, the names of all the Kardashians and how to apply <laughs> which types of healing crystals. <laughs> no, I would, I would have it that it, It's greatly accelerated, but as soon as you learn something new, something else falls out of your head immediately. (laughs) Like, and that could be the ability to walk (laughs) or something. So you're standing in a library reading a book and you suddenly collapse on the floor because you've got to relearn how to walk. And then you pick that book up, learn how to walk, and now you can't hold books anymore. Um, Or you forget how to dress yourself or some like basic fundamental thing falls out of your head when you learn how to do something amazing. Would it apply to audio books and stuff as well then? Yeah, I, I guess it, it, you sh- whatever means the information is coming into your head, whether it's flicking past your eyes or, you know, you're listening to it or whether you're flicking through a book or whatever it might be, or if you're blind braille, uh, that would be funny. You like a uh, blind person is like able to imbibe a book super fast, but then that pushes out the ability to do braille from their head. <laughs> that would be that would be really callous, I think. Well the fingers certainly would be. <laughs> Groan. If your preferred search engine offered a function to exclude all websites utilizing anything other than HTML and CSS, would you use it? And uh, the supplementary, probably the latest versions allowed would be HTML4 and CSS2. So if you had an option on Google or whatever for just shitty old websites, would you use it? Are there websites like that that exist still that don't even use HTML5? Absolutely no features of CSS3? Uh, Yeah, the archived sites that I have, actually, they probably have some HTML5 elements. That doesn't even include like border radius or anything, right? Like CSS2, that's pretty old school. Um, so you could install like NCSA Mosaic or Netscape Navigator or Nine or something like that and surf the web and know that you're only going to be able to view a certain set of websites. Yeah, but things would be broken, right? Whereas this search engine would only serve up results that 
would work in an old school browser like that. I guess being part of a search engine is one factor, but a lot of people actually type the URL in. I mean, obviously, a lot of normal people don't, and they open Google and then type in Gmail and then hit the first result in in, in the results list, which is actually Gmail, when they could have just typed gmail.com in this browser. I realize you're, you're focused on normal people there, right? But, yeah, if there was something that could filter everything I try to go to in the browser, I think it would make the web like 1999 and really rubbish. Yeah, like, so our our new blog is a static site that has, like, only a couple lines of JavaScript in it, and I think that's great. It's super fast, and, like, it doesn't have all kinds of extra junk that you don't need, but it totally uses, like, a ton of features from HTML5 and CSS3 in order to do that and still serve up, like, a useful website. I would use it occasionally. It'd be a nice option to have. I wouldn't want it to be the default, but when I was uh, at Old Camp recently, my hotel, the free Wi-Fi was terribly, terribly slow, like 100 kilobytes a second or something, and that would have been very handy for doing research and stuff then. But I think when I'm at home with a decent connection and a fast computer, then I don't really need it, quite frankly. Right, and the modern web is hideously huge. Like the any modern web page you go to ha- delivers a an absolute crap ton of assets to you, and it's awful. But it's not likely to change anytime soon because most of the people viewing those sites have multi megabyte internet connections and smart devices that have multiple core uh, CPUs and loads of RAM. Right, so how do you how do you like even get people to want to make their websites leaner and make them want to make older standard like protocols work. What's the incentive there for anyone to do it? Well, you know what Google's doing, right? They're going to deprioritize web pages that that don't use AMP or whatever. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we're, we're essentially talking about at least the early versions of AMP here. Which is crazy because sites don't need AMP to be fast, but they're going to make you use it to appear at the top of Google, which sounds really dangerous and bad to me. Somewhere there's a sliding scale in your mind of when a partner deserves to be in on a choice. Where does that begin and why? So you're not going to go out and just buy a car without consulting your partner, but if you want to buy a chocolate bar... I think you can make that decision on your own. But somewhere in the middle, where is that point? I don't know, actually. Um, My wife would really like a new car. So I think think it it really depends on the relationship. And for me, I think unless I bought something utterly stupid, like, you know, a single-seater sports car that was absolutely useless for taking the children to school, yeah, then as long as I made made a practical choice that didn't result in divorce, then I don't think she really cares. Yeah, but you wouldn't just go and buy a car without talking to her about the fact that you want to buy a car. It might You might not necessarily talk to her about the specifics of it, and you might turn up with, I don't know, a Golf or, I don't know, some equivalent of that, that from another manufacturer that are essentially similar, like an Audi, whatever, Um but we're t- you wouldn't just go and buy a car without any discussion. Not without any discussion. I mean, yeah, sure, okay, chocolate bars, groceries, they're pretty obvious because you just need to buy those. And a takeaway, you know, now and then, that's okay. And then some piece of electrical equipment because the house needs it and maybe we need a new Hoover or maybe she's dropped a hint that we need a thing in the house, so I I buy it. But so long as it doesn't bankrupt us and... Um, it's something we, in inverted commas, need, as I look across the room at a pile of old IBM ThinkPads. <laughs> as long as it's something we need, um, I don't think it's a problem. Yeah, I think, okay. I think a car is at the far end of the scale, but I'm struggling to figure out anything that I would bring home that would be a problem. All right, what about a new laptop then? You're looking at around about a 1,000 quid, presumably for a laptop yeah and so it's say you wanted a new laptop you would talk to her about it before going and buying it or ordering it 
Maybe. Maybe not. Maybe not. Um, it entirely depends on, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying it would be a thousand pounds because it almost certainly wouldn't, but like it, de- it just depends on whether the finances in the house can afford it. And if there's no other things going on that month or no other big ticket items we need to pay for, then yeah, why the fuck not? We're both adults. This is kind of an interesting question, um, because, Um, so Karen and I have been together for, um, a little over a year now. And when we first got together, like a couple months after we got together, um, I went out and I bought myself an Apple watch because I wanted one. And, uh, you know, what I buy myself is not really any of our business, right? And I can do whatever I want. Um, but now, um, that we've been together for a while that there's starting to be more of an impact about these kind of financial decisions. And even though, uh, we still have our separate finances and we, we haven't quite moved to doing like a shared checking or anything like that, there's a little bit more consideration where we're thinking about like, oh, well, maybe we want to go on a trip soon or maybe we want this for the house or that. And so there's a little bit more discussion about how we're using some of our discretionary funds. And it, it's a little bit less of like surprise. I spent 500 bucks. But it's not just about finances. There are other decisions you make, like um, I'm going out drinking on Saturday probably, and I will at least have a conversation. I'm not going to seek approval or ask permission, but I will say um, I'm going out on Saturday. Is that going to cause any problems? And she might say, oh, no, we were supposed to go and have dinner with these people or whatever. Oh, right, yeah, I'd better not do that then. Whereas if it's I want to pop to the shop to get a chocolate bar. I don't know why I've got chocolate bars on my mind. I don't need to even really tell her that because I'll be back in five. Well, I suppose I probably would, right? I'll be back in five minutes or whatever. Yeah, but that's just personal scheduling and politeness really, isn't it? It's not, it's not, there's not anything dramatic. Like we have um, our own calendars and, you know, if there are social engagements, then I do my best not to schedule them when the kids have got like evening things like thankfully tonight sam's football was cancelled so i was able to come home be be here in time for this podcast but otherwise i'd have to organize things it's not i think i think you're kind of alluding to this this relationship where two people are completely independent citizens and they don't talk to each other other than you know wake up in the morning say good morning and go to bed at night say good night of course you're two people who live together you've got shared resources and shared lives you're going to talk to each other about things including things you purchase yeah i think like Joe said though that there there is um, issues of some kind of impact beyond just financials, right? Where especially when you're talking about like social obligations, where um, it it does change to something where like we have our shared calendar now as well. So it's like oh well, we got to make sure that we're not scheduling things conflicting, and that's something where you're not necessarily asking for permission of the other person, but they are involved in that choice of where you spend your time. Yeah, and major life decisions as well. You would definitely talk to your partner before you change job or career or something. Uh, I think that's quite likely uh, because it would have an impact on things like, you know, the household income and whether you're going to be commuting and whether you're going to be able to take the kids to school and those kind of things. Whereas if I decided to not edit this tonight and edited it tomorrow and then moved my preparation for Linux Action News to tonight... I wouldn't need to tell her because she's asleep and doesn't care. But there is a a somewhere in the middle of those two where you cross that threshold. And I suppose what you're saying is the threshold is when it starts to impact other other people, whether it is in your family or the the person directly. Right, exactly. If 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 you go and make a capital purchase, whether it's a laptop, a car, or whatever in between, and you're using a shared account. And at the end of the month, there's no money left for the other person to buy food. Then, yeah, that's an impact on the other person and the dependents who require food to keep them alive throughout the month. So, yeah, I think it's perfectly reasonable that anything that's going to negatively impact other people in the house is reasonable to have a conversation about. It might not be seeking permission. It might just be, oh, I need to buy this thing. Um, and I'm, I'm just letting you know because you're going to see, you know, 50 pounds disappear out of the account to PayPal or Amazon or whatever. Um, sure. But, I, and I, and I know people who do actually talk about every single purchase, like everything that they buy and 
every meal they they make is planned, but they're on a real shoestring budget. And so every purchase has an impact for them. Whereas I'm fortunate enough to, you know, have two salaries coming into the house and we're able to afford to just pop down the shop and buy a takeaway. Whereas a lot of people aren't that fortunate. So yeah, it, the, the scale, there, there's a sliding scale and where you are on the scale is really dependent upon your personal circumstances, I think. But there are certainly people who are, two people who live almost completely independent lives. And I know those as well who have entirely separate accounts, live in the same house, have children and do not share money at all. Like one person pays for the phone bill, another person pays the gas bill. And like, this is my money. That's your money. You know, it's your responsibility to, to look after your funds and I'll look after mine. I said, and that's not a lifestyle I will ever want to live, but I know some people do. That sounds like the kind of people who organize their lives with spreadsheets. The kind of people I'm talking about are the kinds of people who are very selfish about their own property and don't feel that, feel that the money that they earn is theirs and not something that should be shared with someone else. If you want more money, you go out and fucking earn it. That kind of person. I kind of feel like that as um, our relationship continues to develop and get more serious, that it becomes more convenient to combine resources and it starts to become kind of a thing like ah, it's a pain that this thing is separated and and as we start doing more things together that it, it actually alleviates the amount of work that we have to do because we only have to do it once we only have one phone bill to pay we only have one you know this account to take care of and then and it, it just it makes both of our lives simpler in that way so i i I guess I don't really understand that kind of uh, fierce independence of like needing to have everything so separated and and maybe having more things together requires a little bit more negotiation. But but I think in the end that I'd rather be more on that end of things because it makes my daily life simpler. Right. It, It does feel like an old school way of doing things like giving the wife some allowance and then going off down the pub and spending the rest or, you know, go and put it in a fruit machine or using it to do up a motorcycle in the garage, all of which I have witnessed. Those kind of people seem to have very ingrained attitudes about what's mine is mine and what's yours is yours. And even with someone who is their supposed life partner, which I, I can't fathom. I can, I, I can see why they get to that conclusion themselves, but I couldn't do it myself. Mm-hmm.